Okay, we have our 30 second warning. Honestly, I feel a little bit like the Israelites uh, in the desert uh, when we start this class because there's so many different directions that I want to go. And I'm, I, I assume we might do a little wandering. We're going to actually jump back. Uh, I talked a little bit about this in the sermon. I said we're going to talk about something, but you have to wait until class. But there's a... <clears throat> Was that on tape? Can we edit that out? <laughs> Wow, it's so incredible, incredibly embarrassing. Wow, I did not know I could hit that high. <clears throat> Woo! Yeah, yeah. Um, so for those of you who are sleeping and you heard that, that shrill sound, that came from my mouth. So in Exodus chapter 13, verse 7, uh, 17, there's, there's a statement that is made that is... It really puzzles me a lot. And so I want to dig a little bit deeper and maybe you can kind of help me understand. And I think there's a couple things that maybe we can glean from this passage. But listen to this. Okay, so just real, real quick backstory. Um, what has taken place? Um, the Passover has already occurred. Uh, they have now begun the Exodus. There's been the uh, consecration of the firstborn. And now we have in verse 17 of Exodus chapter 13, it says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead uh, them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. So already we have this. Now, now uh, Exodus is going to go so far as give the reasoning as to why God did what he did. And also, um, there was not a scribe that was writing this all down as it was taking place. And so at some point, God had to say, let me tell you what I did. And I'm even going to tell you why I did what I did. So we believe that Moses, or I believe that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. And therefore God said, here's what happened. I want you to write this down. So God said, I didn't take you the short way. And then he says, and here's why. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. I have a, just a lot of, lot of questions about this. He says, I'm not going to take you the short way. Because going the short way, you're in, going to encounter the Philistines. Who are the Philistines? Do we know anything about them? Are we... Are we going to ever hear anything about the Philistine people? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, do what? They have giants. They have, they have giants. We're, we're going to get a great story about that later on. So I have, I have a few questions about this. Obviously, when God said, I'm going to deliver you to the land that I've promised to your forefathers, it's going to be yours. Um. And if God can do the plagues that he did, if he can part the Red Sea like he will, couldn't he have done a little more expeditious way to get the Israelites from Egypt to Canaan? Could he have done this? He could have, but he had a plan. Okay, so I want to talk about that plan in a second because clearly he did. But could he, and I'm not trying to be funny or flippant, but we do stuff like this all the time, okay? How many of you um, have been to Hawaii before? Raise your hand, okay? Um, how do you get to Hawaii? By car, by train, 
I guess you could go by boat. How do we get there? Usually, we board a plane, okay, and we fly over everything else. There's lots and lots of miles. There's lots and lots of roads. There's lots and lots of water between Hobbs and Hawaii. Don't tell me how I know this. I can just imagine. There's got to be a long ways. I've never heard anybody say, I'm walking to Hawaii. Right? Could God, in all his power, if he can, if he can part the Red Sea, if he, can, if he can sustain two million people in the desert for 40 years, could he find a way to beam them, fly them, and blink their eyes and get them from Egypt to Canaan. Could he have done that? If nothing else, he could have taken them through war and they not seen it. The pillars. He could have taken them through war. I mean, stop the war for them to walk through. Yes. The, the way that it's situated and where we think that the, the Israelites could have been is that they really literally were hemmed in. In front of them, they had the Red Sea. On either side, they were in kind of this valley that they could not get up and out of. And so on either side, they have basically have kind of this crevice that they're walking in between. It, it would have been a, a large one, but they couldn't have scaled the walls, not two million of them easily. It's hard enough for them to walk, much less scramble or climb. Okay, they had the water in front of them. And so God places the, the pillar is going to come in between them. So it had been in front of them, and now it shifts, and it's going to be behind them. And that, that prevents the uh, Pharaoh and his army from overtaking the Israelites during the night. Couldn't he have done something like that? Couldn't he have just made like a huge pillar that went all the way around them? Like, but then there's this really weird thing about he says, I better not take them near uh, where there will be a war because if they do they might go back okay so the Israelites were not trained or prepared for war uh, I, they they were bricklayers they were slaves I mean they did not have the mentality, but they had God, right? I just, I keep thinking, but they had God. And if God can, can part the Red Sea, why can't he just part the Philistines? Why didn't he just freeze the Philistines? Why did he say, I have to, and, and I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I should go back and reread it word for word so I don't end up um, saying things I don't mean to say. But he says this, he says, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. They're close enough to turn around and go okay. back. Okay. They're close enough to turn around and go back. What else does this imply? It implies that he still has to let them free will to choose. Yes! Like, like to me, this like blows my mind. Like, they, they have an opportunity. He is not forcing them to go. Think about this. This is, I think this is a really big part that we kind of skip over. It's almost like they have no choice. Like, you know, he let them out there and there they went. But here he's saying, no, 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 I have to be careful. Now, again, I think, I don't know this. And this is speaking in a place in which I know nothing about. Okay. And we are all aware of this. But... I think God is very conscientious of how he displays his power. Because if I'm God and I don't want to mess with the 40 years of just on and on and on, like let's let's just get there, right? It's why dads get speeding tickets all the time. Because they, if I can just, I can't, stay in the car any longer with these people who call me dad like i've just had enough of this right are we there yet are we there yet and like i've you, you see the look in the the my brother's eyes or my friend's eyes when they make a long trip with their their family and they walk in and they're just like <gasps> like they're not breathing the same air as as they have been for the last 12 hours God could have skipped all of that. 
He could have said, I am making a gold, I, I'm going to make an escalator. Like you are going to stand on it like the ones that they have at the airport where you stand on and you don't have to walk. It does it for you. The flat, He could have made one of those all the way from Egypt to Canaan. He could have cleared out the land and then Exodus would totally, it would be like way shorter. Like, miss 40 years and 25 chapters, like, gone. We don't have to, it's like, it's a really great story. Like, look how he led them out. But then, as soon as they get out, get out, God says, I've got to watch where they go. Because if they go in the wrong place, they might not follow me anymore. And John, that goes back to your statement of like, the fact that they, they really had a choice. God didn't force them to leave. He led them out. But even as he's leading them out, he admits, I, I don't control them. He doesn't choose to control them. He chooses not to control them. That is an unbelievable amount of power and love that is required in order for that to happen. And what he displays his power by not displaying his power. Because he is relinquishing control of the people that he loves and the ones that he wants to be in relationship with. He doesn't say, You will follow me. He says, I'm going to lead you, but you have to follow. So I'm just going to go for on a 60 second shameless plug on Wednesday nights we've been starting a book 12 ordinary men uh, by John MacArthur it is um, it's a study we're now two weeks in both of them were introductions um, which I'm only embarrassed about but anyway we're in that the, the first one class that we talked about was God chose these people God chose the unschooled fishermen he chose uh, the hated tax collector. He chose the bitter and angry zealot. He chose the one who would betray him and deny him for a handful of sil silver. He chose all of those. And, and I, I really wanted you, those who are listening, to get this idea of, hey, God really chose me, even though he knew all my past mistakes and, and how I struggle right now today and all my blunders in the future, he still chose me. But then this last week when he talked, when we continued the, the subject of the 12 apostles, he, he allowed them to choose as well. He chose them, but then he also says, you have to choose me. And one of my favorite parts, right after he feeds the multitudes and he says some really crazy things that we remember every week when we eat his flesh and drink his blood. You know, we remember Christ and the sacrifice he made for us. And people heard that and said, I don't get this. It's weird. I don't like it. I'm leaving. Right. And he turns to them and he says, are you going to go to? Are you still going to follow me? I have chosen you. Are you going to choose me? And they say, where else can we go? You have the words of life. And I, I just, I love that that theme is played not only in the Old Testament, but on in the New Testament. And now even today, the question is asked, are you going to follow? And I just want you to know, you have a choice. If you're here because your mom drug you here years ago, bless her. But don't you dare sit in here of the memory of your mother and to honor her. That is not why you should be here. Like, I, I, I sometimes think, I actually thought it this morning. I saw somebody here and I looked at them and my question in my head was, why are they here? I thought, why are they here? Like, they're young. Like, they're not in the youth group young, but they're not. I, they have kids in the youth group. They're like in between that. And I thought, what, 
what would cause a person in that age range to show up to church? I mean, do you, like there is, there's got to be something. Like that is, that's really amazing. If you see a twenty-something hanging around a church, like I want you to think about the sacrifices and the decisions that they have to make, because their peers aren't here. I remember going to church as a child, and I especially remember going to church at, at New York Avenue in Arlington. That was a church probably about this size. And I can remember I had like three or four friends in the youth group, and they were just, they were my best friends. And good or bad, right or wrong, I went to church mainly because there were some really good people there, some kids that I loved that I wanted to be around. And, you know, I, I, these, the messages of the gospel leaked into my goofy um, skin and like they, some of that got absorbed. But honestly, one of the biggest draws was um, Luke, DJ, Sherry, and Chantel and me. There were five of us in, in, in a couple years, in, in a two year period, there were, there were five of us. Period. That was that was the main main group of us in in that age age range, and so that was one of the reasons that I, I went. I, but choosing to follow when the choice means you go out into a desert, well, that that gets to be a little bit harder, doesn't it? And I I, I just think this says a lot about the Israelites. I think it says a whole lot about a God who says, I'm going to deliver these people and then I'm still going to give them a choice. Like, didn't he have a whole lot riding on those, those men and women wandering around in the desert? He says, I have chosen you. But what if they don't choose him? Well, we're, we're going to read about that later on because that's going to happen. And then, and then... God's going to forgive them, and, and then it's going to happen again. Well, you know the cycle. I mean, it's just going to happen over and over again. But there's one more thing I think that I want to get out of this before we move on. I'm sorry we spent a lot of time talking about just this one verse. But, but there's another thing I think that's really important. He says, if they, he says, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. And so God diverted them away from something that could have been a crisis in which they could not overcome. And I just, I think that's really important for us as well to remember that, that God still protects us, even when things seem bad. So, does, um, does the, the desert wandering seem really bad? I mean, raise your hand if your next trip is, I want to go to the desert for 40 years. Do I have anybody? Unless you've lived in Hob for 40 years and then this has been your vacation. Congratulations. I hope you've enjoyed it. So otherwise, um, Carolyn, how long ago did y'all move here? And y'all were only going to move for like a few years, right? Norm's told this story to me a hundred times. Like, yeah, we're going to go to Hobbs. It was just going to be for like a couple of years. Um, and, and you're still with us. What, like It's been, what, 20 years later? Because you were in your 20s when, when that happened, right? <laughs> you, you're still here. But, but again, let me, back to my point. If, if you think living in the desert is really bad, and you think, oh, this is terrible, I'm wandering around the desert. Wandering in the desert was better than facing the Philistines. And God said, I don't, I don't want you to have to deal with that. And then here's the other thing. As, as we come up to the Red Sea, it looks really, really bad. They're hemmed in. They have nowhere to go. First, first they, they, they basically kind of blame God, but then they really just tell Moses. Okay. They cried out to the Lord, verse 10 of chapter 14. And then they say to Moses, hey, were there not enough graves in Egypt? Is that why you brought us out here? Like, seriously. 
And so God has, has led them to a really tough situation. Right? God's about to do something so awesome. I hate to use the word awesome because we use the word awesome when we talk about pizza and football games. But this is parting the Red Sea awesome. Do you know why God parted the Red Sea? So they could walk on the land instead of having wondering how they were all. Okay. He didn't, he didn't make them swim. Why, why did the Israelites walk through the Red Sea? <laughs> to get to the other side. <laughs> This is why we like Judy so much better than Rusty. <laughs> they walked across the Red Sea because that's where God had brought them. That's where God had led them. They had to do something that they never could imagine because God put them in a place where that something that had to be imagined had to happen in order for them to survive. You know, Doug, they had just complained to God. He could have had them slogging through the mud across the Red Sea. No, he gave them dry land. Not muddy, not yeah. dead. Dry land with wall of water on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he didn't have to do anything. Again, I mean, this goes back to what Tim was talking about in the communion thoughts. Like, I'm sorry, God, I, I hate to speak up here, but are they really worth it? I mean, that's how many times could an angel have like raised his hand and said to God, are they really worth it? I mean, you reference to, you know, when God looked at the, um, the people before the flood and he's like, these people are terrible all the time. All of them, every thought of every inclination is on evil all the time. Like, bad, 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 bad. Like, you just want to raise your hand and say, are they really worth saving? God says, I have a plan. Okay, the whole world is terrible and they're evil and all they do is think about and do bad things all the time. And everybody's like, okay, let's get ready. It's time to wreck shop. We're going in there. And he says, I got a plan. I found this guy. And he's got three boys and they have wives and he's got a wife. And I'm going to put eight of them on a boat. And that's my plan. And I sort of be like, not worth it. Like, I can do the math. This is really not worth it. You're going to destroy so much of your, of your creation. And like, we've, we've got to start this whole thing over again. And you're picking out eight people out of millions. They're going to be the ones. This is your plan. So how many times was the angel of the Lord ready to strike? God was just so bad. And somebody said, wait a minute. You know, like Tim yeah. said, I'm not worth it. But yeah. think what you're doing. Yeah. Who's bold enough to stand up to God and say, wait a minute. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have that Abram. Yes, Abram did this. He pleaded with God for Sodom. If there's 50 people, if there's 40, if there's 35, if there's, you know, if we just find five, right? And so um, I, I want us to think about a God who displays amazing power by giving it up and saying, I'm going to let you. And this is something I've had to learn, and I'm not doing a great job with it, okay? I'm still trying. Jennifer and I are still trying. But I can remember, um, I don't know if you had to do this when you were in high school or maybe it was in middle school. Did anybody ever have a baby egg? Do you remember the baby egg? We had to do the baby egg at the school where, where you were given an egg and you had to protect it and take care of it, right? And uh, it seemed like such a joke back then, but like you're carrying around this. We had to carry around a baby like between or an egg, you know, and you always had your friends who wanted to see you fail, who made every effort to watch you fail. And so what you had to do is you couldn't be dumb. You had to be smart, especially if you're in the locker room, like you had to protect your egg. And you knew that the further you got away from the egg, the more likely it was that your egg was going to become a yolk on the ground, right? And so you had to like protect that. Jennifer and I are like trying to figure that out now as, 
as, as our children are getting older and our oldest one's about to go off to, to school and we have to see ourselves, we're like, we have to step back. Like, just, it is so hard to walk away. It, it would be so much easier. It would be so much easier if I could just, like, call Wyatt's teachers and complain about why he had a zero on a paper he didn't do. I can be so much easier to call and be like, hey, would you just fix this for me? Like, I don't want to have to deal with this. Just, you can do it, okay? It is so much harder to say, yeah, okay, it's yours. You have to do it. And commence, and, and this is not towards Wyatt, because Wyatt is better than I ever was, but uh, he still has a lot of his dad in him. Commence banging head into wall. Like, I, you need to fix this. Let's do this. Like, half the time I'd be like, it would be so much easier. Like, why? Give me your book. I'm going to read this. We're going to turn in this paper, and you're going to be done with it, and I'll do it for you, and then I don't have to get that email every week that says, he's missing this paper. He's missing this paper. I could just say, just, and instead I have to say, you know what? I just have to, I have to let him fail. I, I have to let him make mistakes. I have to, and just say, you know what? And he's so tired of hearing this. But we're like, why? Like, you're, the, next, the next semester that you have is not going to be at home. It's not going to be in Hobbs. We are not calling your teacher, your professor, nobody. It is completely on you. You're going to have to figure this out. And it is a million times harder than just saying, I'm going to take care of it. It would have been so much easier. God, it would have been so much easier if he just said, you will do this. I'm, you, but he continually gave them a choice. And he let them fail. And so when they saw victory, when, when God delivered them, it meant so much more. When they found themselves in situations that they shouldn't have gotten into, but they got into because they're humans. And God says, you know what? I'm the God who delivers and I'm the God who rescues. But back to the fact that they crossed the Red Sea because God led them right in front of it. God placed them there. And he did this because he wanted to display his power. And so now I have every intention of putting on my boots and stepping on every toe because I've already stepped on my own toes as I thought about this. But I want you to think about the Red Sea that God has put in front of you. And I want you to ask, as we did in the sermon this morning, can you imagine that God can deliver you? Okay, I want you to think about this. I want you to think that you just spent a year isolated, confused, and frustrated. What is your response? Why, God? Why did I have to be here? Can't we just go back? I've said it and I've heard it a jillion times in the last year. I want to go back to normal. Right? By the way, was normal that great? Was normal really that good? Like all of a sudden, God has placed before us a challenge, and we can either say, This is the worst ever, or He can say, You know what? Why don't you trust in me? Because a year ago, it was a whole lot harder to trust in God than it is today. Like the things that we've had to deal with in the last 52 weeks. Like how many of you growing up in Hobbs had to deal with an ice storm that would rival anything you would see in the Antarctica? Right? We, we went through that. We thought things were bad when we were fighting for toilet paper. Remember that? We thought that was terrible. People running out, losing their heads. They're buying like 48 cases of toilet paper. Like, I need it. I got to have it. I don't know what's going to happen if I don't have it six years from now. Like, we lost our minds. 
And now look what we have. We had this crazy ice storm that comes up. Do you have to start trusting in God then? When you lose power for, for days? You, you think you're quarantined when you, know, you, you have to go out with a mask on. What happens when you can't leave the house at all? Do you trust in God then? When, when you have some, some good friends who call you up and say, I heard that you're running, running low on firewood. What, we have extra at the house. You want to come by and get it? I had to, I had to run over to, to some, some friends' houses and they loaded me up because we thought we're going to freeze if it gets any colder. We used up a whole quart of firewood in like three days. Just We just burned through it. Trying because we, I had no idea what was going to happen, and that was before it got really, really cold. I had no clue. You trust in God then? Do you trust in God when you have a crazy leader? I, I'm not political. I, I don't, I don't have a side unless it's it's God's side, and I don't know what side God is picking. But I know this. What happens when you get leaders that you don't like? Do you think they liked Pharaoh working under him? Oh, he's a really nice guy. (laughs) He lets us make bricks all day. Great job. Good work. What about when uh, they switch from Pharaoh to Moses? Yeah, he has this guy. He has a staff that turns into a snake. That's weird. He calls down plagues. Yeah, he's got a sketchy past, and now he's taking us into the desert. Can you imagine trusting God when there's a guy that you don't really like, and you're not really sure, and you don't trust? Can you trust that God's in control when somebody gets elected into the White House that you didn't want elected? Can you give glory to God when the person who's governing your state is not a person that you agree with politically? I I just think this. Just remember, the reason why they crossed the Red Sea is because God put the Red Sea in front of them or he put them in front of the Red Sea. That's how it happened. They were delivered by God and God allowed them to be in a really tough place. And he said, I'm going to get you through this. I know what you can handle. I know what you can handle. You can't handle war with the Philistines right now. It'll be more than you can bear. And I want you to follow me. So I'm going to, I'm going to curve you away from them. But I also want you to know that I'm a God of power and that I am going to deliver you not over, not around, but through the Red Sea. So I'm going to take you right in front of it. If he hadn't brought them in front of the Red Sea, that would be a story we would never know about. Don't you love that story? He tells that story. Uh, Moses writes that story down. He tells that story because it happened. Because I believe that it happened. And it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't been in a bad situation. So now here's, here's where it comes together. I don't want you to be afraid that you're in a place that you don't like. Because that's when God can be most glorified. Is when we find ourselves in tough times. And then we have this choice. I'm going to pardon the phrase. We have this watershed moment. Pardon the pun. Where we really get to decide where are we going to go. Are we going to turn back and go to Egypt? Are we going to believe that God can part the waters? So we've said all of that. So uh, he says they, they complain. They said, why didn't you just leave us? It was better to, 
to be slaves there than to die in the desert. Verse 13 of chapter 14, I just love this. If, if you haven't thought about putting this on your bumper of your car or hanging it up or, or using a magnet to put on your fridge, you need to rethink that because this is just an awesome verse. It says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. I love 14. If you want to memorize a verse, Exodus 14, 14. This is it right here. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Like God says, I got this. Well, Moses says, God's got this. Things aren't working out. Like the guy you wanted to get elected didn't get elected. God is still in control. When things don't work out the way you want them to work out, still in a pandemic, we still wear masks. We can't go to the movie theater. We're struggling financially. Whatever it is that you're going through, God will fight for you. You only need to be still. I love this verse. And then the weirdest thing happens next. How many of you have read past verse 14? In fact, will somebody um, read verse 15 for me? Exodus 14, 15. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> Do you remember that you know what game I'm talking about? The game you played when we, you were kids? Red light, green light? Not the one you played as teenagers. That's a completely different game. That involves driving too fast. But you remember as a kid you played red light, green light? Red light you stopped. Green light you would go. Do you not get the little red light, green light that's going on here? <laughs> Moses stands up before the people and he says, Don't be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. And then God says, why are you guys crying? Let's get moving. <laughs> now, they're not contradicting each other. Sometimes standing still means that you're moving. And sometimes you're moving. You're standing on the promise that God has given you. That, that trusting in God does not simply mean that you're huddled up in a ball. It means that you're willing to follow him. And that's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to say, okay, it's time for us to go. And so then he's going to raise up his staff. This is, you've all, all heard this. You've read this before. Charlton Heston did this several years ago in a movie. He raises up his staff and the waters are going to part. And then this is logistically a whole lot more difficult than we make it seem to, to play out. Like, I can't remember the largest crowd that I've ever been around, but it's got to be less than six digits. I don't think I've ever been in a crowd more than, I, I would say, 80 or 90,000 people. Um, I had gone to see a Cowboys game several years ago when they were in the new stadium. I think that holds around 80,000 people. I could be wrong. Somewhere around that. That's a lot of people. Like, what happens at those games is that um, after you want to stay for the whole game because it's going to be a nail-biter and the Cowboys are going to pull it out and win, um, obviously. But you want to stay the whole game, and you then sit in your chair for another 30 minutes after the game is over. People have left the field, but they haven't left the stands because there is this quagmire of people trying to make their way out. And they're in cars. It's not like they're dealing with camels and sand. They're dealing with people in cars. And we're talking about 70, 80,000 people. Now, you be totally honest. How many of you have left a Rangers game early because you wanted to beat the crowd? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Oh, it's the Rangers. You, they're like the Cowboys. They'll find a way to lose. Um, like, I can't tell. I may have stayed to like five games. I grew up next to Ranger Stadium. I bet you I've been to 100 games. I probably stayed to five games 
to the very finish. Everybody starts to leave because you're like, I don't want to get stuck in this crowd. That would have been 40,000 people in cars. We're talking about 2 million people. 50 Ranger Stadium all dumping out their people all at one time, except these people also are carrying all the things with them. Can you imagine? I can't. I cannot imagine two million people moving around with all their stuff, with their kids with them, saying, are we there yet? The sweet wife with them, telling them, what are you? Why are we out here? Two million people. And so this, it talks about happening, how long it would have taken. Uh, it would have taken all night. Throughout the night, darkness to the one side and light to the other side. Uh, so that neither near uh, the other. So uh, they, they're going to cross over through the Red Sea. The Egyptians are going to pursue them, and in the process of that, during the last watch of the night, verse 24, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of the chariots come off or get jammed so that they were having difficulty driving. Listen to this. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Why Israelites uttered that same phrase? In fact, this is going to happen for, for a while now. You remember a little bit later on, after they make it through part of the desert, they're going to go spy in on the land that's going to be theirs. And the doors, the, the gates are locked up and the walls are shut tight because everybody else fears the Israelites and the God whom they serve, except for the Israelites. <laughs> the Israelites are like, we can't do anything. Everybody else is like, they're going to destroy us if they get near us. And they're like, we can't do this. And the Egyptians... As their chariots start jamming up and wheels, I mean, the wheels come off the chariot. They're like, let's get out of here. We can't do anything about it. And that's when the, the waters are going to flow back over. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. The Lord swept them in the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. Okay, so we have Egypt on one side of the Red Sea. We now have Israel on the other. And in the middle is Pharaoh and his army, 600 chariots, plus all the other chariots they could round up in Egypt. They're all underneath. Do you ever wonder how, how the Egyptians found out what happened? Have you ever thought about that? Like, hey, where did Pharaoh go? I don't know, but he was like, I think he was going after the Israelites. He got the whole army. Like, they went out. Have you ever thought about that? Like, how long did they wait? And they say, shouldn't they be back by now? Shouldn't they be back by now? Where's Pharaoh? Where's the great and mighty Pharaoh? Like, I, I hurt for the Egyptian people. One, because Pharaoh was a tyrant and he was arrogant and egotistical. And because of his arrogance and because he thought he was so awesome, he brought suffering upon his people over and over again. But I also hurt for the people of, of Egypt because they had to endure that suffering. They buried firstborns. I don't know how many thousands of, of people in Pharaoh's army drowned that day. Can you imagine the wife who buried her firstborn son? And just a few days later, her husband never came back home? But you'll notice if, if we go back and look, he did this so that the Egyptians would know. I think God did them a favor. And my prayer is that there were a group of Egyptians 
who realized that the gods who they had been worshiping weren't really gods at all. And maybe they started to believe in this Yahweh, the God of Israel, who, who now today is the God that we serve. We're, we're out of time. I see kids coming up from uh, the basement. So I guess that means you guys are saved from another 10 minutes of discussion uh, or monologue in this case. Um, but continue to read uh, through uh, Exodus. Uh, we're going to be picking up as they head out into the desert. But there's going to be a really awesome song that is sung by, by Miriam. And we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a look at that next week. Uh, also on Wednesday night, we'll, we'll be uh, continuing our discussion on the 12 apostles. After introduction three, we'll probably start on Peter the week after that. So no promises. Hopefully we'll get there. I want to close this out in prayer uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Father God, I thank you uh, for, uh, for leading us through the desert. Lord, for, for helping us as we have find, found ourselves in front of the Red Sea. And Lord, we can say, God, why have you put us here? Why has this happened? But Lord, I just ask that we celebrate a God who delivers us. Uh, and Lord, as we face obstacles, may we look at them and say, this is going to be another way in which God redeems us and delivers us. And so this is an opportunity for us to glorify him. Lord, uh, as we go out uh, today and and we face those obstacles and find ourselves at the foot of the Red Sea, Lord, I just pray that we will have trust that you can do things and work in ways that just bring total glory and praise to you. Thank you so much uh, for giving us this opportunity to serve you, to love you, and to praise you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.